recording. And as Joe Rogan says, uh, welcome, Pierre. So probably people who are listening to this, they know you, so you're not a stranger to them. But for some of the people who don't know you, you're basically a social media influencer. You have about 155,000 subscribers now on YouTube. And But how would you, if I was like Stephen Colbert, how would you introduce yourself? So like, like, who are you? If you would kind of get this opportunity, what would yeah, you say? I've been, uh, I've been asked this so many times and I always come up with no answer. So I just simplify it. I'm, a, I'm an artist. I make YouTube videos, I make music. I just leave it at that. I mean, I can get in a little more detail, but it's kind of complicated. Yeah, every human being is. So then let's take it way back. I'm talking way back uh, to your kind of upbringing, because I don't know if you share this a lot, but what was your, what was your childhood like? I mean, what, I mean, way back, like when you were five years old, maybe. So how was Pierre yeah, as, a, as a kid? Just get straight into it. Okay. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, at around five or six years old, I, I grew up an only child, so I didn't have many siblings to play with. So I had nice. to like come up with my own ways to entertain myself. And uh, the, the first thing that really struck to me, I really remember sitting in front of the TV, the old greatest magic TV special came on. And, like homeboy was pulling out birds out of his ass. And I was like, holy shit, how the hell does he do that? So from there, I already naturally felt a, an affection towards magic tricks in general. And uh, just the idea of being put in a position where you're like, what the hell? I really liked the feeling of wonder. So then uh, from then on, I moved around a lot from five years old to like 16. I mean, I'm still moving, but I yeah. mean, I, from there, we're just relocating all the damn time. And then from there, I just picked up a bunch of other random hobbies like dancing um, magic obviously skateboarding video making music production all this type of stuff as each house got bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller yeah did you feel like alone when you were growing up as the only child because i'm the only child and i kind of felt strange because i had nobody to play with or like i always begged my mom to like hey make me a brother like i want a brother to play with so <laughs> how was that for you i mean because you, you spent a lot of time by yourself i guess yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, for me, I didn't actually even know. I, now, looking back, I didn't even know that brothers and sisters existed. Man. I was like pretty isolated, and I didn't realize like other kids actually grew up with siblings, and that was the norm. Uh, so yeah. for me, it was only until way later that I not only did realize that siblings existed, but how much of a difference that actually make, makes in somebody's life. So for me, until then, I was just coping with and dealing with the fact that I was an only child, but the fact that I didn't even know that you needed someone to play with. <laughs> I mean, it sounds slightly depressing, but I mean, that's kind of what it was. I don't think that there was a point where I ever wished I had a, a brother and sister because I didn't know what that would even mean in the first place. And I found so many activities to fulfill my time in the meantime anyways, that it, it never really struck to me how important it is to have other human contact around until way way later in my life until like i was like 16 18 and uh from there i was just making a ton of acquaintances and friends to fulfill the void yeah i guess it's hard it was for me it was hard to relate to other people because i was i thought like this world is just for me like this was all just for me and then it's like no there are other people you have to share this i'm like no it's me it's mine but uh why did you, be, when did you become interested in art, not magic tricks, but like art? Or was this kind of at the same time where you discovered magic uh, um, around? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good question, man. Uh, I wasn't conscious that it was even considered an art form, everything that I was doing until I was 17 or 18 when I took an art class. I like the, the magic tricks, I mean, the skateboarding, the video production, uh, even trying to rap and dance over stuff. Those are all art forms, but I never really even considered them art while I was doing it. It was just things that I found fun because I was so bored at the time. But only until I remember I took a ceramics class and then the art teacher came and was like, hey, we need people in our commercial art class. You want to come to ours? Like, okay, let's do it. And then from there, I started really um, diving into what art really was, whether it was through drawing and painting. I started researching contemporary art and just kind of like... Uh, 
analyzed and uh, researched the, the philosophy between, on what art actually really is. And then I realized everything that I've been doing until then was considered an art form. And now I just had a foundation with basic concept and principle underneath what it was actually uh, doing in my life. Until, and that was only when I was like 17 or 18 years old. What about you as a student? Did you have good grades, like in math and like these um, subjects? <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be more badass to say that I just failed every single class and I left school and then I just like became an artist. But I was actually a really good student, man. Nice. I, um, I had A's and B's. I was a really a studious uh, person that always did their homework and was basically a nerd that followed the rules for a good amount of time. And then I realized that half of the rules that were implemented, they actually don't really help you through life. And half of it is just based on uh, these premises that aren't even a real thing. And if you want to get even slightly social or political, I mean, you know how expensive it is to go to school in America, let alone the nonsense that they teach you. So it was until I graduated high school, I started really seeing like, what the hell? Why am I paying? Why would I pay this much money to learn absolutely nothing? Why am I trying to get good grades and A's and D's in a system that doesn't even fight for me in the first place? So then I left that. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's when you become enlightened, right? You have a video on YouTube about that or on the Jubilee channel, I think, uh, that talks about that. So was that when did that start happening for you? Uh, when you started realizing something's wrong with like the basic reality <laughs> or just like the entire world. Was this like uh, related to some uh, drugs or did you start it, discovering it before even? How did that work? Well, the, oh the drugs <laughs> kind of confirmed it, man. Um, I mean, obviously drugs lie to you. They, they put you in a delusional state, but that also opens up a lot of things in that delusional state that actually has a bit of weight to it. So around the time, around 17 or 18, I got involved with like the wrong crowd of people and they were just straight up junkies, straight up druggies. And um, I started experimenting with psychedelics, whether it be LSD, mushrooms, MDMA, all this other uh, stuff. And uh, it really altered my awareness and consciousness when it came to things to the point where I almost lost a good amount of my mind. Like a lot of it, I was believing in like aliens, we're just alien souls being reincarnated in human form. But it also allowed me to view things from a very objective outside perspective of how everything is ran, like what uh, school systems really are, what, uh, what could be our actual fabric of our reality, being consciousness, a lot of the social constructs that we implement on each other might not even be things that we need to follow or you know why should I be forced to become a doctor, a lawyer? Why do I need to do this and this? Why can't I just do whatever I want to do? But um, in some places, the, the system is so heavily implemented that if you go outside of it, it's really, really confusing and hard to navigate your life outside of it. But if you stay in it, it can fuck you even harder. So how long did that last, the usage of mushrooms or something like that? Was that like a year or a couple of months? It was maybe like a three or four month period of doing a psychedelic weekly. Some days, mm -hmm. weeks. Uh, few days in a row and it was like microdosing to the point where it was a little more and a little more each week but it started altering my natural frame of mind because when I mean, you keep doing that in a small amount uh, throughout the, the week it's mm -hmm. it becomes integrated with how you naturally view the world so then you can't really tell what's the drug and what's not the drug even when you come off the drug so I was just kind of in this like really foggy, cloudy headspace, believing in Anunnaki and Planet X and aliens and, you know, all this other crazy new age stuff. So that lasted about three or four months. I realized that I was losing my mind and I was so emotionally unstable that I just kind of one day, all right, no more. I'm done. And the recovery from that took about a whole year, like a year and a half to really ground myself again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was a, it was a long process, but. I don't think I'm doing psychedelics anytime soon after that. Did your parents knew, like at the time that you were doing this? Um, they knew something was up because I was just getting weirder and weirder as the months went on. Uh, and then when the moment that I stopped, uh, I actually opened up to my mom. I remember, and I was like, hey, mom, uh, I just want to tell you, like, for the last few months, 
and hang out with the wrong people. And then I've been doing drugs. And blah, blah, blah. and she was like really accept, not accepting, but kind of like really understanding about it. But I don't think she knew what to do because I mean, there is like a, a racial element in you know Asian culture. You don't open up to your, your parents about fucking anything, like no emotions, no nothing. So she didn't just didn't really know how, how to handle the situation, but she was quite understanding. She didn't punish me for it or anything like that. And mm -hmm. then, um, yeah, for the next year, it was like a really, really hard time to try to reground myself. Is that around the time when you started developing your looks and your style as a person or artist? Or is that later? Yeah, uh, I would say about a full year afterwards is when I started really grounding myself, but redeveloped myself in my look and what I wanted to do. Well, strangely enough, the biggest thing that regrounded me through that time was art, whether it be through music, making the music, or painting like a maniac. It was the only thing at the time that really started centering myself. And it was a whole year and a half worth of painting every single day, and learning an instrument, and just doing all these things within the art world that allowed me to, to kind of figure out what my identity was at the time. So how did you arrive to your current, uh, let's say, look? When you started, I don't know, building this uh, this look, did you get like, when you showed to your parents like what did they think or your friends at the time what what was that like like um people felt weird about it man it wasn't a trendy cool thing to to look the way that i did maybe like in the myspace days in 2006 where mm -hmm. emo bands were popular but the time i was doing it was when i was 19 which was i don't know 2012 13. so it was like it was really strange for a lot of people, uh, the fact that I started wearing makeup and, and stuff like that, but I used it as kind of like a individual rebellion against every opposing external force around me, whether it be my parents wanting to cut my hair and everybody else thinking that they knew who I was because of how I looked. And um, mm. it was my way after losing a good amount of who I was through the psychedelics, it was a way of regrounding who I was physically too. Like who, who, what do I want to look at, look like, and who do I want to be, and what societal forces have been forcing me to act and look in a certain way for so for my entire life that I never even felt right in the first place. Like I never, my hair was always short for a long period of time. I never dressed the way that I actually wanted to because of everything everyone else around me told me that I shouldn't. So when in the regrounding, I was like. I realized how much of a construct, how everybody else wanted me to, to portray myself living in Orange County. I'm like, it was kind of a big fuck you to all of that. And also a, a reclaiming of myself started putting on the makeup and stuff like that. Did you do it on your own or did you have somebody who helped you? Or was this like, just like a journey that took a couple of weeks or months to figure out? How did you start doing that? Um, I remember, well, I started dyeing my hair first. I remember uh, the girl I was dating at the time, I went to her fashion show, and then these uh, hair, what do you call them? Like the hair technicians or whatever, the people that dye the hair, mm -hmm. uh, they scouted her out, and I was with her, and then they asked me to if I would uh, dye my hair for a show too. So once I did that, they dyed my whole hair blue, which took like two weeks of like bleaching. I drove all the way to Los Angeles. They bleached my hair like six times and then layered like three layers of blue. And it was, it was like way too much work for just blue hair. The blue hair kind of like opened up a whole nother route of like physical expression. You know, I, I would always express myself in other ways. Physical was like maybe last. So after the, the, the hair dying, it, um, it allowed me to view things a bit more visually. And then the makeup thing was just kind of on my own, man. It was, uh, I had a meltdown. <laughs> I had a meltdown. And I was like, fucking, like, just getting kind of crazy. It was like a Joker scene, dude. And then Damn. I put on makeup and I was just like, dude, this looks good. Fuck it, man. I'm going to start wearing this. And I, I went out. My, my mom would be like, Pierre, why, why are you wearing makeup? My friends are like, oh, my God. And then they're just, uh, it, it made fe people definitely feel a bit weird. It's funny, man. You put a bunch of makeup on, and in today's world, people think that you're transitioning. They think they thought I was maybe 
a transgender or I was like, uh, you know, switching over in one way or another, but it was just, I just liked how it looked, man. Why'd you have a breakdown? Was that related to something completely different or? It was, it was a kind of the domino effect of the psychedelics in general. Mm. And it would, it would, it was uh, maybe a six eight months after that. And it was a period of extreme isolation because I lost my druggy friends and I pushed all of my other friends away because I was doing drugs. So at that point, eight months in sobriety, I, I was like, fuck, I have no one to fall back on. I don't know who to do. I don't know. My parents don't, I definitely don't understand what's going on here. So I just kind of had like a, a freak out because it was just like, I'm fucking alone out here in California. It's the last place for emotional support or intimacy. Yeah. Is that around the time when you started making YouTube videos or when was that kind of, why, why did you start making YouTube videos? Well, here's a, here's a, Here's a surprise. I actually made YouTube videos when I was like 14 until I was 16. Maybe Some even younger, dude. I was like maybe 11 years old and then started making YouTube videos at 16. And this was just like, you know, teenage boy shit, like skateboarding mm -hmm. and uh, playing card shuffling type stuff, you know, and stuff like that. And then, you know, around 16, 18, you go through like crazy life changes go through puberty or mm -hmm. consciousness changes and you start worrying about other things so i just immediately just dropped the channel for years and years and i just recently restarted this new channel with the new me maybe three years ago got it and so why did you why did you start it because your content is a bit different than what other people create on youtube because it's longer format sometimes and you go much more in depth in some topics which are not really like uh trendy some are but some are not so why did you was that the purpose to like uh create some sort of channel where people could uh could consume content that is kind of different or <laughs> yeah that that's exactly what the uh the mission was it it was a oh, fuck man i sound like a crazy person it was through another depressive episode where <laughs> it was uh i was uh, really focusing on music and stuff like that at the time but i didn't feel like uh music would practically get anywhere at the moment and i also felt like there i had more that i wanted to say that I just wouldn't get through music like just stuff that i would like to say that you couldn't put in the song so i remember that day i looked I had some random YouTube video with 3 million views and it was some girl talking about her day going to Starbucks and like opening a package. I was like, how the hell does this have 3 million views? And there are enough, there's nothing on YouTube at the moment that was even slightly deeper or maybe deeper that's aimed at a younger crowd or just in a bit more in the mainstream type of a thing. You have like, you know, older, you know, gray haired, philosophers and psychology teachers the possibility you know in, in the thing but there wasn't anything in the uh, mainstream more commercial format with anything that's even a slightly a little bit deeper so i was like dude i'm i'm kind of really frustrated fuck it i'm gonna make my youtube channel today and i'm gonna cover a bunch of topics and in a way that i feel like i had not seen on youtube mm -hmm. so what do you now that you're one of the influencers what do you think about uh influencers is i mean what what's your opinion on somebody who's popular because you're mainly on youtube and instagram right so um uh, what's your opinion on the entire kind of social media landscape and the influencers wow. over there well i just uh released a video last night it's uh what it's really like being an influencer if uh, you haven't got a chance to check it out i think i think you might find it interesting it's um uh, there's a little narrative behind it but it's very is that, real is that the movie you mentioned yeah yeah yep. yeah so i think you'll like it's 17 minutes long but um it's already being well received which is good what i think about the social media landscape and influencers man to be honest i don't like a lot of it i really just do not like i'm not i'm, I'm been willing to go like 90 percent of it it's just so superficial it's judgmental it's unhealthy it's uh the buzzword toxic it's um a lot of the influencers that come up they they come up through really superficial means and it it, it doesn't promote or have a message even behind it it's just it's really uh it's really empty and it's unfortunate to see something as powerful as the internet and social media 
to be used in a way that doesn't aid us at all. I think the, the potential behind the internet and social media is beyond their even scope of understanding if we could actually utilize it in a more productive uh, manner. I mean, there's obviously times where it's great to just fuck around and listen to SoundCloud mumble rap and just have a good time and look at memes for hours on end. But uh, I don't think that the internet is used currently in a way that really, really does support something that could actually benefit us all generally. So after three years on YouTube, what, what sort of drives you right now to get out of bed and create content to avoid the burnout? So how do you cope with that? Because you need to basically, uh, it's like a job, right? So you need to produce content, which is uh, within some time frame because then you kind of lose the interest of your subscribers. So how do you go about that? Yeah, um, that, that's, a, that's the age old question, man. Uh, I, I'm almost envious of um, YouTube creators and influencers that have a very, very specific niche, like, I don't know, unboxing videos or mukbang, ASMR videos, because you just do the same, uh, you know, niche. it's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it is what it is. I don't have a special specified little alleyway that I followed down. So I, I kind of... I'm un a bit unluckier in this sense because there are times where I just don't know what to create or I'm just not inspired. And currently, I just got out of the burnout in a way where I was getting really exhausted doing political social commentary videos because it was over controversial topics that gave me a headache in the first place. I had to research and start making an argument over that. And then when I post it, I get a bunch of comments debating it or they're supporting it or debating it. So I'm reading through those and just every week, just absorbing all of that, like uh, confrontational energy is just like, it gets to you, man. It, it's not healthy in the long run. Yeah. It's just like, there's a, there's some topics that's trending and you're adding to like more videos about that topic and there's more videos about it. And it's just like hundred videos on one topic on YouTube yeah. every day. It's like, damn, that's a lot of opinions. Like, I know. am I and creating something different here or what is Exactly. It? And, but that's how you grow your channel. It's how you get discovered. But mm -hmm. it's like, how long can you do that before you realize that you don't even give a fuck about the damn topic anyways? And here's the thing. I don't think a lot of these commentary channels even care about that trending topic that they're covering. They just are, they need the views, which is a part of the hustle. But you know, maybe they do care about it. I, who am I to speak for them? But I mean, for me, it's just like, I don't think that that's what I want to do for most of my time, putting my own artistic creative energy into like covering why this YouTuber got canceled for this. Type of thing. Is that something you want to do now in the future? More of these um, short documentary series um, moving forward, or do you see yourself doing something different maybe next year, 2020? Um, currently this is exactly what i want to do i want to do these kind of short vlog documentary series i think that there's a lot to be covered in this format because there's only so much you can do when you just talk to a camera with a blank background there's a lot more that you can showcase in this format through a documentary or whatever else and it's um i don't think many people have done this and from the reception of this last video even though it's kind of a short film and short documentary it's really hitting people at a place that's super relatable but it's but it's a hitting in a different place because like when you showcase feeling isolated as opposed to telling people you are the the message gets uh it's taken in a different way so these types of videos are my focus i'm working with my friend richard brennan as well with his videos and we're just kind of setting things up to to really uh, up the production value and what we're trying to do overall I guess it's also like creating art because like YouTube is sort of art, but it's still not that artistic. Uh, but if you create something like that, you have to put more thought into it. There's more production going into it. So it also gives you that feeling maybe like, hey, I've just built something that's like art. Maybe I can show it to somebody or go to some Sundance festival with it. I don't know. That, oh, you're actually, you're a hundred percent right, man. It was, it was um, almost uh, surprising to see the difference of the feeling that I would get making an artistic piece of content as opposed to a commentary piece of content. The commentary just started feeling like a chore. It started like, it, feel, it felt like labor, like, like shoveling. 
mm -hmm. artistic stuff just it was 10 times maybe more work with all the filming and stuff but i felt no labor i felt no, no stress or strain doing that type of thing and then when it's done you have that piece that you could send to sundance or it has more long-term value where the commentary video might have the views in the meantime but it disappears the next day you know it's just like this cheap fast food type of thing you should sell it to netflix man that's kind of that's kind of we have that's what we're, we've been talking about so <laughs> we'll see what happens and uh all right so uh, maybe before you go why did you move to prague um maybe my last question yeah, i mean why i got a bit to more prague? time too it doesn't we don't have to go exactly sure there's there anything else that you want to talk about i'll let you know when i have to go but um why did i move to prague well i know why but like um why did you pick prague first of all and then do you plan to stay here and what's what's kind of your feeling compared you know living in prague compared to living in la yeah um this is a it's a question i get a lot for good reason los angeles looks great in the movies and social media it's it's the land of the fake movie set sort of a thing the the reality of los angeles and california is not a, it's not even close to what it really really is what it really is it's really hey is this true are there a lot of rats in venice beach like I think there are a big lot rats more, yeah there are a lot more rats coming around venice beach and skid row because people aren't taking care of the city there's a bunch of homeless people and it's absolutely disgusting but on top of that even in the nicer places man los angeles just and california just is ugly as fuck it's sunny it has palm trees but it's so ugly there's no architecture you have to drive absolutely everywhere you get stuck in traffic you can't and the people are just empty pieces of cardboard with a smile like taped up and you never really get to know anybody really for anything and uh i was really frustrated living there because i mean there's only so many times you can go to the beach and enjoy yourself before you just long for actual human connection and in a way where you don't have to spend two hours in traffic um, as you can see i'm really frustrated just talking about california yeah but um prague uh in europe in general it's made to, to be able to walk in. It's pedestrian friendly. It's made so you can actually meet up with people on a regular basis. It's absolutely gorgeous. The buildings are beautiful. The parks are beautiful. I mean, the city's laid out beautifully. The girls are beautiful the people are beautiful. And it's absolutely like everything is kind of very harmonious. And I think if you're even slightly creative or slightly artistic, um, Europe definitely speaks to, to your soul. California, man, maybe if you're a straight up influencer, go ahead. You'll probably love Los Angeles, but otherwise, man, it's brutal. So what do you don't like about Prague or just Czech Republic in general? Um, there are times where the, well, definitely I hate the post office, the postal service here. Hey, me too. Sucks, man. It's, I got a package sent to me and it got forwarded to China somehow. And you call nice. for some customer service and people are just terrible. I don't like the customer service here. It's like we're used to overly friendly uh, customer service in America. People mm -hmm. are just like, what, what do you want me to do about it? I cannot help you. I was like, what do you mean? You're they're supposed to help me. But a lot of people say they don't like the, the cold demeanor of Czech people and whatever it is out here. I personally enjoy the, the, the bubble and the distance because when you really get to know somebody, dude, you become really good friends with them and you, you connect at a deeper level. So at face value, everyone's rude, but you really get to know them. It's longer lasting where in California, everyone's really, really friendly at first and you will never actually get to know them over the years. Hmm. That's funny. Well, what do you think about kind of, I don't know, the modern society with social media, because basically what if there comes a point where everybody's an influencer or some sort of an influencer, isn't yeah. that the point where kind of that the entire, I don't know, structure loses power because it's like, that's everybody's, especially teenagers or gen, whatever that is alpha or Z, I don't even know. Yeah. They, they kind of, that's just the only thing they want to do. So what do you think about that? Like in 20 years, how's this going to look like on Instagram? Everybody's going to, everybody's going to have like 20,000 followers, 50,000, 100,000. What then? I mean, it's already happening with TikTok, man. TikTok has a bunch of Gen Z 
they all have a million followers. Uh, I mean, I, I created a secret TikTok just to see how easy it was to grow on it. I haven't yeah. promoted it on Instagram or any of my platforms. I'm already at 1,400 followers or something like that. Nice. With no promotion. So with Gen Z, that, I mean, that app is just made for um, getting famous quickly. So, I mean, there will be a bubble that eventually pops where, like you're saying, when everybody's famous, nobody's famous, right? So there's going to be a whole new economy that gets created, which it already is. But I think, um, strangely enough, it's going to have, it's going to start leveling up. It's going to have, it's going to be a lot harder to create good content to gather a following too. I think that, um, I hope I'm just being optimistic. I hope people who genuinely create good content with high production value are the ones that get seen because they're going to be the ones that stand out above the other people who just get, you know, famous for no reason. I just mean being optimistic. It could go the complete opposite route where everybody just becomes famous for no reason at all. But, um, yeah, man, I, I think, uh, it's going to be really interesting to, to, to see because everyone's already getting famous. It almost means nothing to, to have a following. Like the amount of followers I have would be considered small to most influencers in general. Yeah. I think it, it's so much harder. It would be so much harder 20 years ago to be famous just through TV or something. Then now it's kind of crazy how easy it is. It's not easy, but it is more accessible. And I don't know if you actually seen an interview with Tupac, but he said like, everybody wants to be famous and have money, like everybody. So like, wh why do you think everybody wants that? Why do you think that's like the drive in almost every human um, to be famous or recognizable or to prove something to external world? Like, where does that come from? I have that as well. So like, why do you, why do you have it? Why do everybody has it? Uh, do you know the answer to that question? You know, well, that literal question is answered on my last video, man. So I actually covered this uh, very thing where I, it's like, I go on a quick little, little monologue saying like, everybody wants to be famous, everyone wants to be seen, and no one knows why they want to. For no reason, everyone wants to be seen. And maybe we just want to be loved. Maybe we just want to feel like we, we exist sort of a thing. And I honestly think that's, that's what it is. It's like the younger generation, whoever's coming up, just didn't feel a deeper sense of emotional intimacy. And they felt neglected. And no one actually saw them. I mean, why else would you want 3 million TikTok followers? It's not a natural thing to desire unless you were really attention starved at one point. I think it's, um, it's a need for deeper human connection in a way that's found through a very superficial way, which is, it's, it's not a way to fulfill that void, but it's the closest thing generation or younger generation can do. Yeah, I guess if you go deep enough, you realize like what ex exactly somebody wants, like even in business, like some people wanna make like, I don't know, millions of dollars and then like why? So that I can spend more time with my family, but you're not spending it with the family. You're spending time in business 24 hours a day. Like that's exactly preventing you to do what you actually want which if you took a normal job, maybe you could spend more time with your family, which would fulfill you more. So then why are you lying? And then it's like, damn, <laughs> everybody's kind of, everybody doesn't know what they actually want, like on a deeper level. They just kind of see the surface, like, I don't know, fame, money or something. But then like, why? So I just got about maybe like five more minutes, but to go, to go sure. off of what you're saying, man, it's, um, I think, uh, I mean, it strangely enough ties in with a lot of like weird esoteric 2012 Mayan calendar stuff, but it, it is a time period where we're actually awakening to certain things that we would have never been aware of before, which is the deeper human connections, which is the spiritual fulfillment of things. I think everybody now, even if they aren't making a shit ton of money, they know that the, that, that isn't the actual secret or recipe to life. So people already are looking for things, the meaning, the purpose of, of, of whatever it is in the first place. And uh, this is like a, another, another trans, transitory transition period in terms of where our psyche is going to go. We have all the abundance. We have all the resources. We can communicate like this. It would be better if we were on the other side of the world so it could be more dramatic. But you live down the street from me. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, with that all being here, What's next? What are we really looking for? You know, it's every, I can just download food. I can just go and, and 
just get my hummus and pita bread in a second. But with all that there, what's, what's the next step? I think deeper human connection, spiritual enlightenment, fulfillment, and, and, and those types of things. Are you religious in any way? I'm religious in that sense. I wouldn't say I'm religious in an organized, orthodox, you know, discipline. I think I, I have a general religious view of the world, meaning that there is a deeper sense of meaning and purpose inherently in all of our lives. I do believe in um, not necessarily a like a soul. Yeah, let's just go with that. A soul. A soul that, that uh, needs more than just food. It needs more than just sex. That needs that that there's there's a little bit of ever, there's a little bit more to all of our reality than just our biology. So, do you think when you die, your soul is gonna die as well, or do you think it's gonna live on that thing that's your consciousness or whatever? I think um, through my psychedelic usage, <laughs> it changed my mind. I was a hardcore atheist for a long time, and uh, I thought when you die, you die. But then. Uh, I believe that consciousness, the awareness of everything, is the first and primary force of our entire reality. So anything that is biological or anything that just exists needs awareness to know that it exists. So say, for example, if you did die and you saw only black, you would need an awareness somewhere to know mm -hmm. black, like a camera or something to at least know what it is. So I think for awareness to only exist as a human being like a primitive ape is just like absurd awareness has to exist on other in other forms rather than just like this homo sapien neanderthal thing there's 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 gonna be there has to be like at least one level above us of aliens that like created our simulation or some some shit i don't know what it is but and some is. trees and plants below us or dogs something like that yeah their consciousness that they that exists below us to think mm -hmm. that there is an awareness but above us is just like, come on, man. Dogs can have it below us and we're just dogs <laughs> or whatever the fuck that else behind us. That's that's so cool, man. Well, Pierre, I guess you gotta go, but thanks again for sharing with us your thoughts on consciousness and on Prague and everything else. So yeah, uh, good luck with everything and uh, we're gonna see each other soon probably. Thanks, man. Yeah, let's definitely hit up some Indian restaurants soon. Definitely. So good luck with the documentary and I'll see you later. Thanks, dude. See you later. Bye.